their queerness and trendness if they so want to. The choice of whether uh, LGBTQ plus people share that aspect of who they are with other people is very complex, right? We have personal uh, factors involved. Some people, you know, on a basic level, some people quite rightly say it's no one else's business, right? Uh, or they might be like me and blabbing about it to everyone who will listen. Um, there's also interpersonal factors, right? Who's in the room? And the research that I did with uh, LGBTQ learners about how they read rooms certainly revealed that that's one of the most powerful factors. Um, we've got micro context. So the classroom itself, the institution it's embedded in, uh, these are very important factors. Does it have, you know, what I found was that learners are looking for like, does it have all gender bathrooms? Does it, are there kind of safe space figures up and around? Uh, does it have gender studies courses uh, in, in the institution? That kind of thing. And then obviously the macro context makes a huge uh, impact on whether it's safe to share that information with people, right? Here we're thinking about things like state or uh, nation state level laws, uh, societal attitudes, that kind of thing. So it's a very complex kind of ecological decision that people are making. But as teachers, we certainly have a power within that interpersonal and the micro context to make a difference in terms of creating inviting uh, uh, environments for queer and trans learners. So that's the goal, is to create an environment that is inviting, if they so wish, to share that information with us. We can do that by demonstrating our LGBTQ plus uh, affirmation through, for example, our use of inclusive language, right? Students pick up on that. If you're comfortable, share your pronouns uh, and then invite, but don't demand people to share their pronouns uh, that they would like to use for them in the classroom. Um, and that can change for people too, depending on how safe they feel in the classroom. And um, I'm gonna share some kind of the language that I use to do that with uh, students. And share an explicit commitment to inclusion, including queer and trans uh, inclusion. This is one thing that came up. What I found was that students were doing an immense amount of guesswork, constantly trying to assess and pick up for clues, like what newspaper does the teacher bring articles in from and things like that. What do I know about that? What can I infer about their level of LGBTQ plus friendliness from that? We can take that guesswork out by just telling them that we're there for them and for various other uh, kinds of students who might not always feel at home in our classrooms. So this is an excerpt from my um, from my syllabus, um, and I've sort of developed this over the years. It's a promise to students that I'm going to do everything I can uh, to make sure that this is a comfortable learning environment for them. And I explicitly, amongst other things that are very important to me, um, I explicitly obviously mention gender identity and sexual orientation. And I also start setting some expectations too. Uh, about the expression uh, of certain kinds of views that I, you know, somebody told me once to think of the classroom as like a cell with kind of permeable walls. And we actually get to make decisions as a community. And as teachers, we have a proactive responsibility to make decisions about what you're willing to let in and out of that cell wall. And so I set uh, an expectation of non-homophobic, non-transphobic, but also non-racist, non-ableist language, and so on. Uh, and I invite them to sort of tell me in any way that they want at any point in the course, because sometimes it takes trust, right? They need to, they might not want to share that information with people straight away. And students do, they absolutely do email me a few weeks into the course to tell me something, or oh, I want to write about actually the fact I'm trans, and I want to write about that in my assignment, but I don't want to share that with the rest of the class. Absolutely. And then we figure out a way to do that. And I also include this statement too. So I share my uh, pronouns, just reinforcing the idea that we can't assume what they are uh, and that I remind them that, uh, you know, they can let us know at any point and in any way that works for them. 
So these are just some examples, and you know, maybe you've got some language as as well. Uh, and it would be great if we get. I learned a lot from seeing other people's models of this. Number four is uh, don't proselytize, but usualize. Um, it's a really big concern, and I know it comes up a lot whenever I talk to other teachers about this. Is well, am I imposing my beliefs on students, uh, or am I forcing people to what to think? Um, and I would say, and I'm going to use uh, Tyson Seaburn's work uh, to show what usualization may, means, but my personal take, and it is different to other people's, but my personal take is that we should resist any desire to change learners' minds. Um, not only is that very unlikely to be effective at all, um, but they, it also smacks of neo-colonialism, right? Um, what other people think is actually none of my business, uh, and I have no control over it, nor would I ever want to. Um, instead, and, and that, again, that doesn't mean that we have to allow the expression of hateful views in the classroom. That's a difference, right? Um, and instead, what I would advise, and, and this is a little bit different, you know, from an issues-based approach, the first thing I would do is to take a utilization approach, which is to integrate LGBTQ plus people, their lives, our language, into the general fabric of the lesson, just like we're integrated into the real world in which all of us participate, right? So somebody mentioned uh, family. Uh, family lesson is one of the first things that we teach or even pronouns and things like that. It's so easy just to, we don't have to make it a big deal. We can just talk about it as a fact of life and effective language. Uh, this is an example from Tyson Seaburn. Has anybody seen this before? Tyson does great work on inclusive uh, language education and materials development, and he has a book uh, exactly on this. Um, I certainly take my lead from Tyson. Um, and so because publishers have been so slow to make any changes, um, he created this kind of mock textbook chapter and actually, the topic of the textbook chapter is work-life balance. It's not about LGBTQ plus issues at all, but he's just taken the care to integrate LGBTQ plus people into that. And this is just one page from it. I really encourage you to have a look at this. It's kind of a radical imagining of what it could look like uh, if textbooks and materials really reflected the lives, you know, my life, for example and the life of people in this room, the life of people we know. Another big thing that comes up uh, when we think about implementing LGBTQ plus inclusive and affirming pedagogies is, but what about the students' culture? What about the students' religious beliefs? And these are, you know, definitely something that we need to think carefully about. Um, and this can work both ways, but often what I find is that it's a form of essentialism, where somebody's making a huge claim about one group of people that couldn't possibly be true. So, for example, this is from uh, Rhodes' work, uh, and she remembers teaching uh, a student called George, who was from Eastern, from an Eastern European country. And George said, uh, he was kind of expressing homophobic views in the classroom. He said, I can't help it. That's what we believe in my country. Well, who's that we? Because it's not the queer people and the trans people in that Eastern European country, and it's not the people that love them. And so we often find that dominance tries to make claims that says, actually, that's what everybody believes. That's our way of life. And certainly, for some people, it will be true. But for others, it won't. The same goes also for teachers, right? Sometimes, I know that I have, we sometimes make assumptions about our students based on other factors that we know about them. So again, this is uh, some other uh, work from Rose and Coda. Um, we have many students, Muslims in particular, who would feel very uncomfortable if they felt pressured to accept what they view to be Western values that they don't agree with. I did exactly this the other day. We had a new student from Indonesia come and join our department, and we had lunch together. She wears a hijab, and so I knew that she was Muslim, or I assumed that. Um, and later that evening, 
I was going to be running the, the 2S LGBTQ plus affinity group meetup. And she was brand new. And I thought, oh, should I mention that? Because another student that was there kind of asked me about it. And I was like, I, she's just arrived. I, I don't know how she's feeling and things like that. And I did mention it and it was fine. A few weeks later, we had a guest speaker come and talk. My colleague, Julia Spiegelman, came to talk about the experiences of non-binary learners of French and Spanish. And that student came and sat down right next to me and we had a great conversation about how passionate she is about making sure that the two non-binary students in her class in Indonesia are integrated and feel supported and things. And I thought, oh, Ashley, you idiot. Like I did exactly the thing that I had just written a blog post saying that we shouldn't do. So it's so easy to do. It's so easy to make assumptions about what somebody else believes based on some kind of surface level judgment. And so I really urge, and, and I'm speaking to myself here, that we need to resist cultural and religious essentialism. We need to resist our own cultural and religious essentialism, remembering that there are queer and trans people and allies in every cultural and religious group. And we learn also, we need to learn how to offer simple counter narratives. Uh, so, you know, we can say things like, you don't have to tell that person they're wrong or anything like that, but you can just say, there are LGBTQ plus Qataris, for example. This was a huge debate around the World Cup, right, in Qatar. Um, massive debates about LGBTQ plus rights and hosting the event in that country. And some people were saying, well, that's not their culture. Actually, there's loads of queer and trans LGBTQ plus Qataris, and they were often interviewed in the World Cup. Um, or, you know, for example, there are LGBTQ plus friendly Catholics. We have to be able to challenge those kind of essentializing ideas, both within ourselves and when other people express them. The sixth idea is to resist any kinds of activities. And this is where it really helps to assume that LGBTQ plus people are in every single class that you teach and the people that love them. Don't debate LGBTQ plus lives. Uh, I know it happens in real life. This is uh, an image from, I think it's the Irish referendum on same-sex marriage. And I, it turned out great in the end. It was horrific for the Irish LGBT, well, the Irish same-sex people who had to live through this. And here, their families, their friends, their neighbors, debating their basic rights. It's dehumanizing for everybody involved. These decisions shouldn't be up to that. We should be better than that. Unfortunately, I'm not going to put the, the citation for this. This is from something that was published uh, in a huge journal in 2021. And this was uh, put forward as an LGBTQ plus friendly pedagogy. So they were asked to briefly discuss their opinions on same-sex marriage and transgender bathroom use. Just imagine. And, and it was very clear from the way that this was written that the assumption was that there were no LGBTQ plus or transgender people in that classroom. Imagine sitting there, and you might not have shared that information with other people, and to have them debate or express, you know, well, I don't think they should be, or whatever, right? Um, and I wrote a, a kind of counter piece pointing out, and, and to the author's credit, they said, absolutely, we were wrong about that. Nobody should be doing this. Um, in some parts of the world, yes, the dignity, rights, and existence of queer and trans people are unjustly and inhumanely debated. But including here, right, in the US, um, our students deserve learning environments that are better than that. And so reminding ourselves that there are queer and trans people in every class, we need to resist activities that invite people to debate or even give their opinion on queer, trans, uh, queer and trans people's worth and rights. I, I don't, this is gonna sound awful, but I don't actually care what other people's opinion of that is. Uh, it's certainly not in a classroom, right? Uh, they can, they're entitled to their opinions, but it's not necessarily something that I want to give we don't have to give 
oxygen to unreasonable views. We really don't. And we don't have to subject any of our students, no matter what their views are or how they identify, to those kind of dehumanizing debates either. So earlier I talked about we really need to start integrating um, more representation, right? And we won't find it in the vast majority of textbooks. So we might have to select those representations for ourselves. Has anyone seen this documentary? Oh, you've got to see it. It's, it's on Netflix. It is about trans representation in film and TV. It is... I think almost everybody that speaks in it is uh, has trans experience. I think the producer, it's you know, for us, by us kind of idea uh, as they made this. It's very good. And what it does is really pull apart some of the nuances of representation. So we can think about, for example, some things uh, are actually very transphobic that we might not recognize, right? Friends, the TV show Friends, which is still popular with a lot of learners is incredibly transphobic, not something I would, certainly those episodes I would not be showing in class. That's not a positive representation. It's not an affirming representation. Uh, things like Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, is critiqued uh, in this uh, documentary as being incredibly transphobic. The New York Times, did you see recently a 1,000, over 1,000, contributors to the New York Times wrote an open letter to the editor to protest the overwhelmingly transphobic coverage uh, in the New York Times uh, that they're currently seeing. And, and they give examples of explicitly transphobic language that their writers have used on the front page of the New York Times. So you might, you know, go to grab some sort of progressive liberal stalwart text and actually it can be very tricky. Uh, and so learning about how to select better representation. So I talked earlier about that taxonomy of different kinds of representations. So I have an article uh, that I'm very happy to share. You just need to send me a message. But I also made like, a, oh, I had a joke for this because <laughs> look at that hair. <laughs> this was during COVID. <laughs> I was experimenting with, uh, what can we call that? There's no words, is there? It's like a <laughs> my uh, my barber. I remember when we could finally go back to get our haircut, and the barber was like, "What? What made you choose this? <laughs> Who did this to you?" I was like, "My husband." <laughs> anyway, um, I digress. But basically, in this video, I set out uh, this kind of five broad ways that we can think about different kinds of representation. It could be explicitly uh, discriminatory, um, such as those examples I just talked about, like Ace Ventura or that front page of the New York Times. It could be erasive, right? Erasure. And that's what we see in most language textbooks. Um, or it could be marginalized inclusion, where people, uh, LGBTQ people are included, but it's in like a controversial topics, taboos, or debates, things like that, right? Um, sometimes we have something like mainstream inclusions. Any of you seen Modern Family, right? There's two, there's uh, a gay couple in that, right? But they are white, they're rich, uh, they have kids, they're monogamous, all these sorts of things. They're kind of, they really are completely in sync with kind of mainstream U.S., North American values, right? Uh, they're the kind of poster children, if you like. Um, and that's okay. It's absolutely fine to coincide with mainstream norms, but if that's the only way that you can be included and there's not space for other people and other ways of living your life, then that's kind of oppressive. And, and so what we're looking for is something like critical inclusion, where we've got a variety of people, we're kind of fully fleshed out, well-rounded, holistic people, we have good days, bad days, that kind of thing. Uh, that's a whistle-stop tour of that, but please do feel free to, you know, that video is obviously publicly accessible. I'm very happy to share that. And I have a workshop uh, where we can, like, bring in, like, textbooks and, and analyze this book. And so, yeah, use the taxonomy. You can even use it with students as well to analyze your current materials and guide your future choices as well.
I think this is actually the most important idea that I'm going to share today, number eight, which is that all of us need to routinize. I had to practice saying that word a lot last night, Rout routinize, routinize. I think there's a difference between U.S. and British <laughs> pronunciations for that. Um, learning from 2S, and here I'm reintroducing uh, in a very purposeful way uh, to spirit, uh, because it should come first, right, in this acronym, based on where we are today. Um, 2S LGBTQ plus people. Um, and that the 2S there standing for two spirit in, in digi-queer communities that you know, these are identities that have developed and, and community roles within indigenous communities uh, within North, across North America and, and Turtle Island um, that don't fit into things like lesbian or gay or bisexual, right? Uh, and that often involve a melding of gender and sexuality as well. Uh, so I'm a member of the LGBT, the 2S LGBTQ plus community, but as we know, that community is very vast, incredibly diverse, and I don't know what it's like to be a trans language learner. I don't know what it's like to be a two-spirit learner. That's why we have to find ways to learn and keep learning from the communities around us. So well, one of the ways that I do that, certainly, is by uh, Twitter. I use Twitter a lot. I've learned so much from it. And the, why it's been so effective for me is because it's a routine, right? I check it every day. Uh, people share. Obviously, it's just a tweet. That's nothing, right? But the best tweet is, as you know, managed to convey a whole load in just a short uh, number of characters. But they include links to other things. Um, that works for me. And it's definitely uh, one of the main, the biggest kind of policies of any kind of allyship is that we need to, as Carlson uh, and uh, her co-authors say, like, uh, listen, shut up and read, right? We just need to keep learning. And it needs, as Chris Neasley has pointed out, it needs to be kind of rooted. We need to find subscriptions to things um, and keep learning. So think to yourself now, like, where do you do most of your learning? Where do you do your regular learning? Is it like me on social media or maybe books, documentaries, podcasts, these kind of things, whatever is going to kind of, and certainly for me, I like to push of something that it just kind of comes regularly and it's in front of me and it's so easy to start learning from. At the same time as we do that learning, it's important to decolonize our understanding uh, by listening to the voices of two spirit and indigenous queer people. I would also say learn about the queer and trans people and identities in the home countries of your students as well. They might not be, even know about that because of kind of colonial erasure and things like that. Uh, but lots do. Those, uh, the Japanese participants in my very first study talked about how sad they were because actually, um, not all of them, but some of them said they had a really rich uh, culture of same-sex uh, relationships uh, in especially like the, the kind of samurai era and things like that. And they wish that they could go back to that, but it had been kind of erased by this kind of westernized uh, version of what gender and sexuality can be. Uh, so there are all sorts of, there's a huge rich kind of history wherever we look. Number nine, I know this comes up quite a lot, is to prepare a framework for dealing with difficult classroom moments. So I chose this image of the, the what is this? A sand timer, an egg timer, hourglass. That's the one I'm looking for. It's that weird thing, right? We've all experienced it. It's almost like time slows down and speeds up at the same time, right? I know my heart is pounding, but the class seems to kind of freeze for a second when something happens. And it happens to all of us, right? We've all had somebody in class, maybe it was even us, who said something that's kind of problematic. Um, my answer to that, the best answer I've found is to proactively prepare a framework for dealing with difficult moments. Uh, this is something that comes from Gordon West. Uh, he's got a great paper where he writes about this moment in a teacher education program where a, teachers, a group of teachers from Korea said something very homophobic. And he did not know how to handle this. 
he kind of froze. And then he started over the next few days and weeks withdrawing from the class, ignoring them, kind of, he just wasn't, he wasn't a huge fan of his reaction on reflection, right? And I love that piece because he's very honest about it. He thinks about what he could have done differently. And one of those things is to prepare. So this is just an example. This is my example of what I would do. And I have a similar framework for things like this, right? I know from not my personal experience, but others, sometimes when we do workshops like this, there'll be someone in the room that said something homophobic or transphobic. What are you going to do then, right? And so I have a framework for that so that it's not so scary when it happens. So this is my example for a class, right? So first of all, I'm going to put in the groundwork to proactively establish my expectations of non-hateful speech uh, and inclusion. And you saw an example. If something happens, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to try and assess the level of likely harm to me and to other people in the class. I'm going to remind myself that I don't need to know what to do immediately, right? Uh, and that I can call a timeout if need. I can, we can totally do, we can cancel the class. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? We can say, okay, we're just going to take a five or 10 minute break and think about how we're going to respond to that. That's absolutely fine. This, again, this is just my example. Yours is going to look different, but this is what works for me. I'm going to let people who may be upset take a break if they wish. They don't have to engage. If we decide to talk it out, not everybody has to sit there and listen to that. I'm going to acknowledge to myself that we haven't all had the same learning opportunities. I've got to make a promise to myself that I'm not going to leave problematic ideas unchallenged, even if it's another day that we come back to it. I'm going to see if peers can do it dialogically, because there's a power imbalance, right, between a teacher and students. And I've actually seen this happen. A student in one of my classes expressed kind of anti-Black racist ideas about Black language and homelessness and things like that in, in, in an anecdote that they chose to share with. And I didn't know what to do actually in that moment. What happened was the students stepped in and they dialogically kind of offered a load of counter stories, counter evidence, and they, they actually did a much better job at it than I did. But it was, that's what happened. Um, and then critically unpack it with others after. And that's exactly what I did. I sent an email to my friends and supervisor at the time, who's a very kind of famous anti-racism in language education person, Hugo Kubota, uh, and I sent her an email about it, and we kind of unpacked it, and my key question always was, how could I have done better? How could I have responded to that? And, and that kind of has influenced some of these points. So yours, like I said, is likely to look different, but I can't tell you how helpful it is and how you can become undaunted by having a plan like this in place. And you don't have to formulate this alone. You can, and this is my last point. How are we doing for time? I think we're pretty good. Okay, uh, find your co-conspirators to do this work. I think that's one of the things. So how many of you work with other people in the room? A few, but not everyone, right? Sometimes we might feel that we're alone and I know that that came through on some of the kind of survey data that Will shared with me uh, from the previous session was like, well, I don't know. I feel like I'm the only one who's doing this. How do I reach out to admin? That kind of thing. I'm in a Catholic institution. I'm not sure what to do about this. Um, there are all these kinds of, when we feel alone, it can feel like too much. So my advice the final piece of advice is to find your co-conspirators and do the work together. So send out an open invitation, right? Send out, uh, who wants to work on this? We really need to work on it as, a, as an institution. I know some of you are passionate about it. Let's get together and think about things. Manpower, and these are some of the activities that you could do together, right? Not all, but some suggestions. So you could map out your contextual constraints and affordances together, right? I know that there are people joining us from other states and we know that legal frameworks can differ uh, a lot. Um, and I absolutely acknowledge that, uh, that it's gonna 
the, the extent of the work that we might be able to do could be different depending on the context where we're embedded. Uh, but it's, it's very empowering to kind of map it all out and not just the constraints, but the affordances as well. What kind of legal frameworks can you draw on? Identifying some ambitious yet realistic goals for LGBTQ plus inclusion and affirmation. And create those support networks, right? Have your debrief buddies. Uh, you know, can, can we all agree that if something happens, we'll work together to figure out a strategy for, for, for repair. And, you know, organize ongoing PD opportunities. In this, uh, again, all the references in a couple of slides, uh, and you'll be able to walk away with those as well. In this uh, news, is it a news? Yeah, it's a newsletter piece that I wrote. There's kind of three PD uh, kind of ideas that people could implement in their own institutions. Um, so that's it. Those are my 10 ideas for how you can implement uh, LGBTQ plus affirming and inclusive practices in your language classrooms. I really tried to, there's lots of takeaway things and tools that you could implement. Um, here are all the references. And uh, if you scan, it's on the next few slides, so don't panic. Um, but um, if you scan this QR code, you can get access to all of the slides today. Um, which includes the references and the links. Some of these are behind a paywall, 